Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's a blessed day and very beautiful, even though we have a little bit of showers, so we need showers. So I welcome all the regular members. And uh, when we worship God, so we have to be happy and worship through God, not the, the uh, one fake one. So we want to worship all the true God. I worship all, I welcome all the members, especially uh, regular members. And I think we have uh, one first time visitors here. If you have any first time visitors, if you don't mind, you can stand up so we can see who you guys are. Oh, there is one. Okay. Oh, there are two more. Okay, welcome. Welcome to Brownsburg. Oh, there's one more. Welcome to Brownsburg Church. And if you are really looking for a, a permanent church, we are here. And uh, we have any second week visitors here? I don't see anybody here second week. Okay, any regular visitors also, we are welcoming you. And uh, we have a few announcements today. And especially we have a great day for tomorrow. And uh, we have to clean our church and uh, we start around 10 o'clock. So please be here at 10 o'clock with uh, all the uh, instrument you want to bring it, cleaning staffs, power washer, or uh, whatever you want to do, the gardening, or uh, uh, shape our uh, uh, lawn, everything, so we can bring and do and look our church beautiful, not the one we want, the bad ones. We want to see, shine this church in this area. Not only, you know, we worship, we want to see, we worship the true God. That's why we know our church is beautiful, then the true God is here. And if our church is not beautiful, our true God won't be here. So we want to worship our true God. So come on time. And after finishing our work, we have a great party for pizza. And the pastor is donating for that one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, the next one, we have other one. We have a meeting today for our business meeting. And uh, I invite all the members to come because we have to discuss so many things and uh, we need to uh, uh, discuss how we pro progress this church. Not uh, just, uh, you know, we just talk every week, uh, we want to do this one, that one, but we want to really accept to do it. So please come, everybody, so that way we can grow this church and we can preach the gospel so we can wait for our Jesus to come fast. No, we don't want to wait longer time, 10 years or 100 years more. So we want to see Jesus to come in our time not in our generation time. So please come and we can discuss all that, those things. And uh, I think Pastor have one last announcement. Thank you, Donnie. Very quickly, we have a problem. I got everybody's attention. I like everybody's eyes just <laughs> That was awesome. I should say that more often. No, it's a good problem is if you're coming here week after week, you know that the sanctuary is getting very full. Amen. That's a good problem, right? And uh, I know some weeks we're, we're putting extra chairs out to accommodate people. Well, what I want to ask from some of you, and it won't be all of you, we're, we're trying to make a plan in the interim while we, while we think of bigger, p bigger fish to fry as far as what we're going to do about our church and its growth. But we want to create an overflow room. And I know there's some technical work that's being done and looked at right now to make sure that's possible. But we're looking at using the fellowship hall as an overflow room. Now, you know, when you come here on Sabbath, it's not just to see somebody preach, right? It's for, it's for that worship time, but it's also for fellowship. So we want to make sure that we're able to provide that fellowship aspect that you can't get at home while still creating space for visitors that may come so they can sit here in the sanctuary and we don't have to... Um, have such a hard time navigating that. So 
our plan is to create an overflow room in the, the fellowship hall where we will have the, the service streamed to a screen, but we'll also have a place where people can have fellowship together and worship together still. My call to some of you is if you have that mission in mind where you would be one that's willing to, if tapped on the shoulder, stand up and go over to the overflow area to make room for a guest or a visitor, I, I just want you to, if, if you are willing to do that as a, as, an, as a matter of service, if you would please tap me on the shoulder, if you would tap Juan on the shoulder, or if you tap uh, Rodney or Sandy, can, can Rodney, is it Rodney, I think they're all getting set up for communion, so, but if you can tap one of us on the shoulder, let us know, hey, if I need to move to make room for somebody else, I'm willing to do that, can you just let us know? Uh, I know some people may not prefer to do that, and we, we're not calling on you to do that, just the people that have that burden. So that, that was my announcement, um, great problem to have, and I'm excited for what God is doing at this church. Thank you, Pastor. And uh, today's uh, offering is the Indiana Advance. And uh, we have a, a online, you can give to online also. And uh, those who wish to give online, so you can give. Or we have a box behind the wall. So you can go when you are leaving the church, we can deposit there. So that's the uh, offering. And we just pray for the offering. Our uh, God, thank you for this blessed day, and especially thank you for your uh, present here. We pray all the blessings we receive, so we are returning portion of that one to you. So bless the hands you given, and uh, bless all the offering and multiply it and use for your uh, work. And we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. And uh, I invite for the a praise team to continue our worship. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church family. I'm so happy to see you all this morning. So good to be together and worship the Lord. I hope you all had a blessed week. The scriptures say we are to offer a sacrifice of praise. This morning, we are God's living praise. Let's open our hearts in worship. Let us be a living praise to God. Please stand as we praise him, as we sing. I sing the mighty power of God. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, we are so grateful to be able to be here this morning. We're so grateful that there is no place where your presence is not. And Lord, so we invite you in a special way. Lord, may the Holy Spirit power come into our midst today. May it fill each of our hearts. And may we learn of the love of Christ and his great plans for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Please join us as we sing our song of worship, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. now time for our congregational prayer. If you have a special prayer request, there are prayer cards in the backs of the pews. Please take one, write your prayer request on it, and let us know if it is a request just for the elders or for the entire church family by marking it appropriately. Then bring it to the front and place it in Elder Cook's open Bible. Also, if you have a special burden that you do not want to write, but you want to recognize before the Lord, Please feel free to join Elder Cook up front for our special time of prayer. As you bring those forward, we will be singing the second and fourth stanzas of I Surrender All. morning. Great to be in God's house again. <laughs> always is, always is. If anyone else has a prayer card they'd like to bring up, feel free to do so. And if not, let us kneel as far as we possibly can and we'll seek the Lord in prayer.
Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, it is indeed a joy to be here in your house of worship, to sing and to praise your name. We are grateful, Father, that you are always with us no matter where we are, no matter what we are doing, no matter what we are involved in, you are always right beside us. And we thank you so much for that. It is such a blessing to know that we never have to wonder or worry if you are beside us because you're always there. We thank you so much, Father, for all your many, many blessings that you bestow upon us. Every day of the week, when we rise in the morning, you're with us throughout the day. When we go to sleep at night, you are right there beside us. We thank you so much for everything that you do, Father. We pray, Father, especially for those that could not be here today. Whatever their situation, if they're ill, we pray, Father, that you might place your healing hands upon them, that you might touch them and bring them back to health. For those that could not be here for other reasons, Father, I pray that you will be close to them, that they will feel your presence in a mighty way and know that you are beside them as well. Father, we're grateful for our pastor. We thank you for the message that he is going to bring today. And we just ask, Father, that you will be with him, that you will give him a special ministry, Father, that will help us to be able to understand what he is telling us today, that we might be able to use whatever he gives us in his message today that we might be able to use in our life in the future. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do. We just ask that you will continue to be with us, to guide us and direct us in all that we do. We thank you, Father, for your many blessings, and we especially thank you for hearing our prayer today. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory forever and ever. In the loving and precious name of Jesus, we pray these things today, and thy will alone be done. Amen. It is now time for the children's story. Children, please come to the front to hear a lesson to prepared just for you by Kevin Cox. There we go. Thought I saw a few more of the back there. How we doing? I'm going to come right down to your level now, okay? We've got a special little man here. All right. How we doing, guys? The story today is about David and Goliath. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath? We can just zip through it. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a little shepherd boy named David. Do you know where David lived? Where did David live? In Israel. And what did he do? What did David do? David was a shepherd. He looked after sheep. Has anyone looked after sheep before? I will tell you now, they're crazy. I used to go vacation in a small country called Wales in England, or near England, and the sheep all over the place, and they're crazy. So David had a full-time job looking after sheep, I promise you, okay? One day, David's father, Jesse, told him to take some food to his brothers who were soldiers. They were fighting the Philistines. And when David arrived at the camp, he could hear one of the Philistines shouting at all of the soldiers. Shouting even louder than that. Anyone know that Philistine's name? Goliath. Yeah. Goliath was an enormous, enormous person. He was over nine foot tall. So I'm going to just size up here, right? If I stand... What's this guy's name? Kamari. Hey, Kamari, how you doing? All right, I'm going to stand up and we're going to size off, okay? Ready? All right. How you doing? <laughs> Big size difference. All right, I want you to remember that size difference, Kamari, okay? So, Goliath had threatened all of God's soldiers, the Israelites. And nobody would accept the challenge to fight him. Everybody was scared of him. King Saul had offered all sorts of prizes, armor, giving him the world, and still nobody had the uh, 
brave, nobody was brave enough to go and fight this giant. But when David got there, he was like, yeah, I'll fight him. You guys brave enough to just go and fight an adult? Do you think? Could you do it? If your mom and dad were like, hey, I need somebody to go fight an adult. How many of you guys are going to, yep, I'll do that. Not many. It's scary, right? When somebody's bigger than you, it's scary. So, do you think David went and got all his armor on and got some swords and some shields? Nope. What'd he take? Anyone know what he took? He took a sling and five stones. And he went out to meet Goliath. Mm -hmm. And using his sling, he threw a rock and it hit Goliath right in the head and knocked him down. And he ran forwards and he drew Goliath's sword. And this is a part of the story that not many people think about. But David, you know, he wasn't a huge guy. And trying to lift up a giant sword must have been pretty tough, right? But he lifted up. And the gruesome part of the story, he cut off his head. But he beat the giant. All I want to say to you guys is if we believe in God and we have faith, we can do anything. And Kamari here can beat me any day. All right. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke 23, verse 47, and it says, So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Let the Lord bless the reading of his word. I was considering the, t the, the day on which we're serving today, the, the communion service. It's always a, a time when I'm reflecting and thinking, okay, what am I going to share? Because it's out of, the, out of the streamline of my normal preaching plan. And so I, I went back this time and I just started reading the story. And there was one thing that stood out to me in the story today, in the scripture reading we just read about this guy by the name of Centurion. So today we're going to look at the gospel through the eyes of the Centurion as we get our hearts ready to receive communion. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you today that we've been able to worship you in song. Thank you today that we've been able to consider the Holy Scriptures, the accounts of how you worked in people's lives in the past, the way you gave them faith, the way you gave them courage. Thank you, Lord, that you always are pointing our eyes toward your son, Jesus Christ. And so today I, I ask that you would exalt him in our midst today through your holy word and by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So centurion, when we, when we normally think about that, that word itself, the first thing that comes to our mind is a century is what? A hundred. So it seems like from history, centurions at first were leaders of about a hundred soldiers. They were non-commissioned officers, probably the closest thing we have today to them, non-commissioned officers in the army, but obviously this was 2,000 years ago. When centurions were first formed, it became a thing, about a hundred people, but over time their group grew less and less. It seems like during the time of Jesus that they actually were in command of about 80 troops. You go a couple hundred years later, it dwindles down to 30 or 40 troops that you were in charge of if you were a centurion. There were some very important things that you had to, that qualified you 
for being a centurion. Really, three of them were the most important. One, you had to look the part. Now, I probably would have missed out on that one because typically centurions were these rugged men. If you, if you were coming up and, and you were chasing somebody down and, and going to do something wrong and you came up against the centurion, you would look at them and you would think twice about what you were about ready to do. They were imposing people, big, strong, muscular. They had the, the face of steel, so to speak. But not only that, they didn't just look the part, they, they were the part. You didn't become a centurion if you didn't know how to use weapons well. These people were experts in a sword or in a dagger, in fist fighting, whatever they had to do as, as warriors. You didn't become a centurion unless you were a fighter and had proved yourself in battle, an expert with weapons. The last criteria that a... Um, centurion had was that they were eager to follow orders their commander said jump and they said how high it was said that the the centurion was more eager to follow an order than to have any any kind of other conversation so if they were in the midst of talking with somebody an order came cut the conversation go do what they were told to do they were men under authority who had authority. And so when you think about this centurion that's standing at Calvary, we don't know his name. We don't know really anything about him except for basically two encounters that he has, two places he has in the Scripture. One place is he's standing at Calvary, and he makes some very important observations that are recorded for us. A little while later, and we won't talk about this much, but this is the guy who Pilate is really surprised when he hears that Jesus is dead. He has these two guys, Joseph and, and Nicodemus, coming to ask if they can take Jesus' body down. And Pilate's really surprised that Jesus is dead already. And so he sends for Centurion. And Centurion comes back to Pilate and says, yes, he in fact is dead. You know how they found out he was dead. They stuck the spear in Jesus' side, right? But our focus today is what happens at Calvary, at the cross with Centurion. The, the Gospel of Mark says in, in Mark 15, 39, it says the centurion who stood facing him. Can you kind of get that picture in your head? Now, he was posted there for a very important reason because here you had this, this popular preacher, Jesus, who has a big following. Centurion's job was to make sure this crucifixion went off without a hitch. He's probably in charge of actually directing the process of crucifixion. He has his soldiers around, and they're at various stations to make sure that nobody's going to interrupt the the, there's not going to be an uprising. The crucifixion will happen. And he's there to make sure that nobody by any means gets off those crosses of the three people that are up there. It's probably a little heightened this time because Jesus, as I said, he's uh, become a pretty popular character. He has been traveling around. Uh, multitudes of people have been following. Just a few days earlier, he'd had a whole entourage that welcoming, welcomed him into the city. And here is Centurion, the one who's been trusted to do this. Now, he's probably seen crucifixions a hundred times. Have you ever, anybody worked in a, in a, in a situation or been in a situation where, you, situation where you had to get hardened a little bit, maybe a little jaded to, to uh, pain and suffering? I, I understand this happens a lot with people who have gone to war. If they see a lot of death around, they just kind of have to block it out. Um, I've, I've since that maybe on a minute level, when I worked in the emergency room, it took me a long time to learn that, that I had to, to kind of block out when I would stick a little needle into a baby. <laughs> to, you know, we, we sometimes in healthcare, we hurt people to help them. It's kind of weird. We poke them with needles and we, we cut, them, uh, cut them here and there and we, we, give, we in, inflict pain in order to promote health. It's really a bizarre thing. But it took me about two years to get used to the idea of sticking a needle to get blood work from a baby or, or um, cleaning a wound on a little child and they didn't understand what was going on. And um, you kind of get a little hardened to it.
I recognize, one of the things I recognize in that, for those of you that might be in healthcare or, or going into healthcare, I recognized after a while that a screaming baby was a healthy baby. <laughs> if you made the baby scream, that was a good thing. If, the baby, if you were doing something that should make the baby scream and they didn't scream, that baby's sick. And that's a bad situation. So that's an interesting, uh, interesting when you think about centurion going up to the cross and whoever he had stick that spear into Jesus' side and Jesus didn't even flinch. And they know. Normally, a person that was being crucified, this was a long, drawn-out suffering, right? They, they finally would go unconscious, but even if they got poked and there was some painful stimulus, they would probably react to that. And so that's how they knew Jesus didn't react at all. And so a centurion's seen, who, who knows how many of these he's seen? Dozens, hundreds, we don't know. He's presided over these crucifixions before. He knows what to expect. He's hardened to what, to what he's watching. He's seen it happen. He knows what's going what's to take place. But centurion, it said in our scripture reading in Luke 23, 47, it says, now when the centurion saw what had taken place, now, it's kind of vague as to what had taken place, but we know a few things from the accounts. We have all three Gospels that tell this story, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't. John adds some details. He doesn't mention Centurion. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about the story. They all give you a different angle to look at it from. And Centurion had seen some things. We know there's something supernatural, something miraculous that had happened just before Jesus died. There was a, there was a period of darkness. Do you remember that? It said the sun went dark, the whole earth. Now, this would, uh, I know, for those of you that watched the eclipse a few weeks ago, you know that when that, that darkness happened in the middle of the day, we knew what was going to happen, right? We knew, we planned this, everybody's looking forward to this, and it happened, and it was, even if you know it's going to happen, it's kind of weird. Did you experience that? It's just kind of weird. The, the birds start singing their, their nighttime songs, and then they just a few minutes later, they're singing their wake-up songs. If you notice, uh, I hope you all saw this, there's, there's sunset around the whole horizon, the colors of sunset, just beautiful. But here's, there's, there's no record of any solar eclipse during that time when Jesus died. This was a supernatural event. Nobody's expecting this, and it goes dark for three hours, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. So this is something that Centurion has seen. But not just that, there was something even uh, more interesting that he, see, that he saw. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that uh, the thing that really got his attention was that Jesus did something right before he breathed his last breath. John records the words as Jesus cried out. He says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The Bible says, and he cried out in a loud voice, and then he breathed his last breath. See, this, is, was, this was not what people being crucified did. People being crucified, when they were getting to, ready to, the, to breathe their last breath, they didn't move. It was this slow, progressive, slowing down of breathe. They, they would have respiratory difficulty, and then their breathing would slow down and slow down. And so There was not a peep coming out of a person's mouth when they were dying from crucifixion. And it says, the Bible says that when Centurion saw that thing, he cried out a couple things. When he saw that thing in one of the Gospels, he says, truly, this man was the son of God. In the Gospel of Mark, he says, truly, this man was innocent. And it sounds like it spread to his, his soldiers as well. Because in, in the Gospel of Matthew, it also says that, that those who were with him said the same thing. Truly, this was the son of God. There was this spreading sense that something significant was happening at Calvary. Not only was this, was this the son of God, now this is a, probably a pagan, right? This guy doesn't know anything about the Jewish God. Now he's in, he's in Judea, so he probably knows what those people believe, those weird people believe. But he's probably a pagan and he recognizes that God, something's happening with God today on Calvary. And he has, even, even this hardened centurion has this sense of just, injustice being done. He says, surely, this man was innocent. 
you know, I, my sermon title, Innocent Until Chosen Guilty, that's a little play on words there. How is it supposed to read? Proven. It's interesting to me, as I thought about that concept of this pagan Roman hardened man looking at Jesus and what had just happened and saying, this man's innocent. I started looking around. You know, all around Calvary, everybody's saying the same thing. Think about it. Pilate's wife, she had a dream. Pilate's dealing with Jesus, trying to navigate through this this is a kind of tedious situation. Pilate's wife has a dream, comes to him and says, have nothing to do with this just man, this innocent man. Pilate's wife knew. Pilate, in fact, twice comes out to the priests and the people and says, I find no fault in this man. Twice Pilate declares Jesus innocent. There's a thief on the cross. Now, if you read the stories, you get the picture that these, both of these thieves on the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus at first are like, are like kind of heckling Jesus, giving him a hard time. Yeah, if you're the Christ, go, get down from the cross and save us too, they say. But one of these thieves comes to his senses later on. And this one thief says, he hears the, the one across the way heckling yet again. He says, hey, we deserve to be up here, but this man's done nothing wrong all around calvary and now down to the centurion Pilate's wife he's innocent Pilate, he's innocent the thief he's innocent now the centurion he's innocent do we ever question god's innocence i mean if you're human like me sometimes oh god why are you letting this happen to me why are you doing this to me? Isn't that a little question of God's innocence, isn't it? Why have you created me like this? Why am I the way I am? Why do I have the passions that I have? It's your fault, God. You ever do that? Oddly enough, the people that weren't embracing Christ's innocence were his very own people. <laughs> the, leaders, the leaders of the people who... who um, who had him crucified, who turned him over to the Romans so they could crucify him, it's those people and, and their followers, those are the ones that are proclaiming, oh yeah, he's not really who he says he is. He's not really innocent. He's guilty. In fact, that's why they brought him to the judges, to, to profess that he was not innocent but guilty. And I wonder if sometimes as we as Christians need to check ourselves in how we relate to God because the declaration at Calvary is that God is innocent. God is innocent. In fact, the Bible says it in many different ways. It says we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. In 1 Peter 2, verses 21 and 22, For this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. We have a perfect Savior. And, and I, it doesn't escape me that today we're actually celebrating that very thing. There's a reason why we have communion with unleavened bread. Leaven was a symbol of sin. We are recognizing, we are testing today that we have a Savior that is innocent. We use unfermented grape juice, unfermented wine, you might call it. So when we, when we share the wine today, it doesn't have that, uh, that uh, death happening in it, that fermentation that's a, that happens only when things die. We use grape juice to represent something that doesn't, doesn't have corruption in it. We are celebrating today Jesus' innocence. And it's in that very innocence that we find our salvation. It's in that very innocence because God required innocence to be able to stand before his throne and we've all checked out of that option. <laughs> all of sin, the Bible says, all of sin falls short of the glory of God. God demanded that the only way we could stand again before his throne was through pure innocence and we've all failed. But one didn't fail. 
and he laid down his life in suffering and punishment so that we could get that, that chance to be in, in front of God's throne. He chose this. He chose to be guilty. The Bible says he was made sin for us. He was made to be sin for you and me. The things that we wrestle with, the stuff that's in our hearts that's opposed to God, the stuff that's in our hearts that's so full of selfishness, the lack of innocence that we have, Jesus said, I freely lay down my life for you. I freely give my perfect life as an offering so that you can be made whole and so that you can live eternally. 1 Peter 3.8 says this, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, today, as we partake of the communion service, I want to invite you to look upon this innocent man of Calvary, to look upon him and the gift that he gave for you, to look upon him as the only way to be right with God and to stand before his throne and to know with assurance that if you receive him, you've received all of heaven in one gift. Stand there with Centurion and say, surely this is the Son of God and surely he is innocent. Let's pray and then we will get ready for our communion service. Father in heaven, we, we're so grateful that we can take a step back and look at Calvary through the eyes of the centurion. Lord, what happened there that day, I, I don't think we can get to the depths of it, but to know that we have someone who lived above sin in this world, to know that we have someone who who is able to overcome where we have all fallen. And not only to overcome, and he didn't just overcome and step back and say, good luck to the rest of you, Lord. He overcame and he offered himself his perfection for our imperfection, his death so that we could live. And Lord, today we proclaim that he is innocent. Lord, we proclaim that you are innocent. And Lord, we proclaim Jesus Christ as our only means of salvation. Father, please bless us as we get ready to enter into our communion service. I pray that your spirit is very, very near to us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to give you a couple instructions as we prepare for our communion. We do. Uh, prior to our communion service here at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we do do foot washing. Uh, as Jesus commanded, I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. So we wash each other's feet. There, is a, there are three rooms set up, one for couples over here in the fellowship hall, and then the two rooms over here, there's a, one for men to participate in foot, foot washing, and there's one for women to participate in foot, foot washing. If you decide that you uh, don't want to participate in that, that's okay. Please remain here in the sanctuary, but we ask that if you stay here in the sanctuary just to just to uh, stay in the spirit of meditation and prayer, okay? After we come back, we will, practice, we will do communion. We practice open communion here at Chapel West Seventh-day Adventist Church, so you do not need to be a member to partake of communion. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have, I said Chapel West, I think, <laughs> didn't I? For those of you that are visiting, I, uh, I have two churches, so... <laughs> Oh, that's embarrassing. They're going to love me over there for that if they see this. At Brownsburg, um, forgive me for that. I, I, am, I still do some human mistakes occasionally. We do practice open communion here at Brownsburg. And um, what that means is for any of you who are not members if you've received Jesus Christ, you are welcome to participate in our communion with us. If you've received him as your Savior, that's our, that's our criteria. And so I will invite us now to exit the back of the church, go to the rooms for foot washing, and we will come back here in a few minutes to do, to do our communion service. Thank you.
Welcome, brothers and sisters, to the communion table. As you participate with the, the Lord today in communion, I want to let your mind dwell on his innocence that was given in place, fully in place, nothing holding back. There's no sin that can't be washed away by the perfection of Jesus. There's no sin that can't be forgiven by the perfection that was in Jesus Christ. There's nothing you're wrestling with that can't be overcome. There's nothing in Jesus that withholds you from heaven. And I want you to take communion today with full assurance that in him you have salvation. I'm going to, the three of us up front will be kneeling as Juan offers a prayer upon the bread. Father in heaven, you gave us your scripture. In there in John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the, the, the bread of life, mm -hmm. and whoever comes to me will not be hungry again, mm -hmm. and whoever believes in me will not be thirsty. Uh, Father, we, we kneel before you, recognizing that we we hunger for the wrong things. Or we hunger for those things we this world offers. And we're in need of you. We um, we need Jesus to count our life. And uh, we need a bread of life every day in our lives. In the really early in the morning so you can renew our minds and our heart. You say your, your word doesn't come back to you empty. It does, it does the work in our lives. It, it converts us to a, be, a better people. So as we partake uh, the bread today, we remind that you sacrifice on the cross. You give up your life so we can have the eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, the three of us will kneel together as Elder Bruce offers a a prayer for the juice, and we invite you to pray with us. Lord, we know we serve a loving God. Today, as we go through our communion services, we reflect upon all the sacrifices that you made for us ultimately with your death on the cross. The juice that represents your blood is evidence of just how much of a pain and sacrifice that you gave to show your love for us. And it is that love that gives us that hope of your return and your salvation. Let us have this juice at this time Please bless each and every one of us. Amen.
Paul continues, In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until that day when he comes again. Isn't that the time that you look for two brothers and sisters? When you will be proclaimed faultless, spotless before the very presence of God Almighty. In the name of Jesus, amen. I want to invite you to stand with me as we cling, sing our closing hymn. As the praise team comes up, I want to remind each of you that on your way out, one of our deacons will be, have a tray to collect an offering. This money will be go, going to help those that have uh, tangible needs, those that need, need financial help. <laughs> Now may the Lord go with you, the innocent one who laid down his life for you. May he lift all your burdens and may you walk in his strength each day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.